Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand count right there this morning. Would you do that? Would you do that? Would you do that? Now, uh, 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 am, am I doing the offering? Uh, if they already did it. You already did it? Oh, oh, okay. All right then. All right. You guys be seated because I'm, I'm going to sing. I want to say thank you very much, uh, Pastor Adam, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me here. Pastor Dick and Carla, thank you so much for being in my life. You all have a, a huge fingerprint, more than one fingerprint on my life, on my ministry, and on my career because it was from out of Jubilee that, that I was launched into the world. And I'll never forget, it was in September of 1995, when my music was going all over the planet, you said, Ron, you came to me and told me, you said, Ron, I don't know if you remember this, but you said, Ron, I believe God's going to hold me accountable if I don't release you to go out and, and minister to all of these places, because I was, folks, I was content to stay at Jubilee till Jesus came back. I, I really was. I, I really was. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. But I, I, I got to get on with the service because I went too long in the first service and I want to make sure that I, is it okay now? Uh, all right. Okay. It's, all right. Well, we'll be here to four o'clock then. I'm telling you. Okay. All right. But listen, it is the Valentine's season and I got a couple of songs that I want to sing for you. So it's a Valentine's season. So we're going to stay in the in the spirit of love. And I'm going to sing a song now. Uh, well, let me say it like this. How, how many of you like love songs? Yeah. See, look, all, all the ladies' hands go up. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know that's true. All right. But you know what? I believe this. I believe that the whole New Testament is a love story. It is. It's a love story. It's about a man who is saying to his bride, okay, that he's going away to prepare a place and he's going to come back and get her. See, now in John chapter 14, in John chapter 14, in the King James now, in the King James, it, they say it like this. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not true, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Now that does not sound like a brother in love. <laughs> no, see, they should have, Pastor, they should have let me write it. They, they really should have, see. I, I would have wrote it like this. My love. <laughs> Sweetheart, don't worry about me. Come on, don't let your heart be troubled. I have to go away. I'm going to prepare a place for you and me. You need to know this. You, you really need to know this. That in my father's house, he's got all of these mansions. Girl, my father is loaded. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And I'm going away to prepare this place for you. And I'm coming back for you. Yes, just for you. And when I come back, it's going to be you and me together. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, now, to stay in the flow of the season, I want all of the married people, all of the sweethearts to hold hands right now. Okay, hold hands. All right. Okay. Now, all you guys, I want you to look, look your sweetheart in the eye. Okay, look her in the eye. And, and say in a, a very romantic, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Baby, is that your daughter? Baby, you got to let them sit together. <laughs> you, you, I mean, I, I, you, you got to let them sit together. No, no, you can come back. You can come back, but sitting on the, on the, there you go. 
There you go. He, he, all right. Now, I want you to look, look her in the eye. Look her in the eye. There you go. And say in your most romantic, very white voice, I love you, my dear. <laughs> okay, now. Come on, girls. When, when he says that to you, you know you got to kiss him now. Go ahead. All right. Happy Valentine's Day. Yes. All right. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. All you single people, raise your hand. If you're single, raise your hand. Come on. Raise it up so I can see it. I, I want you to do this. I want you to put your arms around yourself and pretend you're holding Jesus. Go ahead. Hold him, Sherry. Hold him. Don't let him go. <laughs> All right. Now, we're going to sing this song. I, I recorded this song some time ago with Darlene Check, And it's called, You Are the Love of My Life. You Are the Hope That I Cling To. All right. And as we sing it together, let's make sure that we sing it to our Savior. All right. Go ahead and play that. All right. to you mean more than this world to me I wouldn't trade you for silver or gold no I would not trade you for riches untold you are you are Could not live one day without 
He's the first and the, he's the beginning and the, I do this and I see how many people go to Sunday school. He's the one who was and is and, the one who lived and died and, he's the Alpha and, he's the one who sits at the right hand of the, interceding for you and, he's the ancient of, ancient of, ancient of, hey, ancient of days, hallelujah. Clap your hands this morning. Can you turn the track up some more, please? Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation bow down. And every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare Every knee shall bow down in worship You will be exalted And your kingdom shall not pass away Oh, ancient of days Is that Karen Deary? <laughs> blessing, blessing, glory and power be unto from every nation, all the creation bow down, and every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare. So bow down in worship, you will be exalted, and your kingdom shall not pass away. Oh, ancient of deeds, hallelujah! Come on, blow your horn with me now. Here we go. Ba, 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 ba. Come on, Adam, give me some trombone. Your kingdom shall reign. Your kingdom sing unto the ancient of days. None can compare to your master's worth. Sing, everybody, sing. Oh, and every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare. Every knee shall bow down. In worship, you will be exalted. And your kingdom shall not pass away. Oh, ancient of days. Oh, ancient of days. Oh, ancient, oh, ancient of days. Oh, ancient of days. Father, we love you and we give you praise. Yes, we bless your name today. Hallelujah. There is none like you, Father. From beginning and to the end, from everlasting to everlasting, your blessings will never end. You are the ancient of days. Blow your horn. <laughs> Hallelujah. of days none can compare to sing unto yes your kingdom sing unto none 
can compare. Sing, church, sing. That's why we sing. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing unto. Yes. None can compare to your master's work. Yes. Sing unto the ancient of day. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, glory. Oh, glory. Go ahead and sit down. Hallelujah. Go ahead and sit down. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah, I got some up here, Adam. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about my products that I bought. I br brought, <laughs> not that I bought. Well, I did buy them so I could bring them to you. So, oh, okay. Uh, first, I want to do this, and, and, uh, and I want to, like, say to you, Pastor Dick, uh, much I appreciate you and call and love you guys, and what a blessing that you have been in my life, because it was out of Jubilee that was the launching pad for not only my life, but my ministry and you guys, your fingerprints are all over my life and my ministry. And so I love you and I appreciate you and I thank you so much. And we, we, we did this book together. What year was it? You remember? It was a long time ago. It was a long time ago, but we, the, the, the publishers of uh, Charisma Magazine asked us to write a book together because of the relationship that we had. And I do believe that we had a prime example of the relationship between a pastor and a worship leader. The Bible says, behold how good, Psalms 133, behold how good it is for, for brethren to dwell together in unity. We quote that all the time, but very seldom do people quote the verse that's right beneath that, the, the second verse. It says it's like the oil that's poured over the head of the priest over Aaron, the prophet, I mean, Aaron, the high priest, and it flows down over his head and on his beard, on his clothes and all over him. And see, that's the way anointing should be. Many times when I travel around the world, I get a lot of worship leaders. They want me, musicians and worship leaders, they say, uh, uh, I, I want your anointing. I even had a couple of people come here today and took my hands and put it on them. They, I want your, some of your anointing. You really don't want my anointing because you don't know what I've gone through. You, you don't know what I've gone through for, for this anointing. Through sickness, through airplane crashes, car accidents, uh, uh, divorce, all kind of stuff that I have gone through. See, salvation is free, but anointing costs you something. You're going to go through some things. And I don't, it doesn't matter which character in scripture, it doesn't matter which character in scripture you go to, you're going to find that they went through a whole lot of turmoil or struggles or challenges in their lives to be in a place where the father would use them. And I just want to say thank you so much because the anointing that was on you, I was part of the the clothing yeah, that you wore. Yeah. Amen. 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 He would, I'm, no, serious, I'm going to tell you. He would teach a sermon. And while he would be teaching it, everybody else would be taking notes. The father would be giving me songs. Wow. Oh, yeah. Going up to the high place to tear the devil's kingdom down. Give and it will come back to you. Yeah. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together. Oh, yeah. What, what was that other one? If you catch hell, don't hold it. 
If you're going through hell, don't stop. All of those songs came directly out of his teachings. See? And that's the way that anointing should flow. Amen. 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 And so uh, I'm on the faculty of two different universities, one called Kingdom Life University in Tampa, Florida, and another one called uh, uh, Christian Life School of Theology, which is in uh, Augusta, Georgia. And this book is required reading in, uh, in those ca campuses and in on a couple of more that I, that I uh, uh, speak at at times, that I speak at at times, okay? So these books are out there. Everything is $10. This is called The Priority of Praise and Worship. Praise and Worship is a priority. You got to understand that. Now, we know that worship leaders are not mentioned directly in the scripture, but, and we're not necessarily part of the five-fold ministry, okay? You know, in Ephesians chapter four, we get the five-fold ministry, but, okay, all of those ministries are about preparing us to minister to the people, that's their, 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 those ministries are to prepare the saints for the work of the ministry, okay? But praise and worship is a mandate from heaven. When, when our Savior taught us how to pray, he says, let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. And with every account of a heavenly experience, there's praise and worship around the throne of the Father. With every account. Okay, and he said, let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, and the interesting thing, and I shared this in the first service, the interesting, interesting thing about praise and worship is this. We come here every Sunday or several times a week. Okay, and almost everything that we do is for us. The preaching is for us. The teaching is for us. The praying is for us. The offering is for us. Okay. You think, well, I gave my money. No, you didn't give your money. Because he's going to give it right back to you. That's his promise. If you give it, he'll give it back to you. He, okay. The baby dedication. What did I miss? Baptism. Everything is for us. And the only thing our father gets, the only thing he wants is the praise and the worship. Amen. Okay. So that's, that's very important. And we talk about this in this book, the, the, the priority of praise and worship. Uh, I have another one here called the effective praise and worship leader. I try to write small books for musicians and singers and people in the same lane of ministry that I'm in because most singers and worship leaders and musicians, if they read a book, it's going to be the Bible and, or, or it's a song book. Right. Uh, okay, but this is easy reading. I try to write for them. Uh, everybody say Yahuwah. Yahuwah. Okay. Now, in the ancient Paleo-Hebrew, uh, the ancient Paleo-Hebrew was the same language as the Canaanites and the Phoenicians, okay? This would have been the language that Abraham spoke, that uh, the children of Israel would have spoken when they went into the promised land. It was called Paleo-Hebrew. And the way that they pronounced the father's name was Yahuwah. And in my studies, in my working on uh, my second doctorate degree, I have a PhD in religious studies. And I come upon this name, Yahuwah. And I, I started studying from a Middle Eastern perspective, a Middle Eastern and North African perspective, because that's where the Bible was written. Okay? That's where it was developed. That's where it was written. And, uh, and uh, any of the indigenous people that you might meet when I was in Israel and the indigenous people that I met, they called his name Yahuwah and Yahshua, you know? And so anyway, he wants us to know his name. And uh, so I wrote about that. This is one of my books that you need to know the ancient Hebrew name of our Heavenly Father. And you're going to hear me mention that name several times 
Okay, as we go through the balance of the day, this is what I'm going to teach about today called the elements of worship. But before I start teaching, I want to, <laughs> I want to mention this to you because uh, I know already this morning folks have been asking me, Ron, do you have any CDs? No, we, we don't do CDs anymore. They don't do 45s, they don't do albums, they don't do eight tracks. Hey Amen. You remember those, Danny? Yeah, yeah, they don't do, we don't do cassettes anymore. And now CDs are gone. And it's not even cost effective to buy them and travel with them. But we're in the age of downloads now. So this is a, this is, this is a flash drive kind of a fancy one that you can put on your keychain. I thought I'd try to be a little unique here. Put my name on it and my ministry on it. I'm going to give this to uh, I'll give this to Carla. Because she's one of, my, one of my biggest fans. All right. <laughs> okay. But anyway, and so all of those things are out there uh, uh, at the table. Things that I brought to you brought for you. Uh, if you do want individual songs, just go to Spotify or iTunes or one of those other eyes and you can download it, okay? <laughs> and you can download it, okay. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to try to move fast because I'm not going to do the slides anymore. They slowed me down this morning. Okay, I want you to take your Bibles and go to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. Years ago, when Michael Pitts first came to um, Jubilee, and that was a long time ago, when Michael Pitts first started coming to Jubilee, uh, he taught on this Genesis chapter 22. And it was an interesting sermon that took root in my heart, took root in my spirit. And... It was about Abraham when he took his son to Mount Moriah to offer him there as a burnt offering. Okay. And in going through that and studying that passage of scripture, there's something that I realized, something that I noticed that in verse five, Abraham says to his servants, he said, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So now we know that this is a worship experience based up on verse five of this chapter because Abraham specifically says we're going to worship and we're going to come back to you. Now, the issue that I have and one of that has, 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 has uh, just challenged me as I travel around the world is this. The Christian music industry has made music, Christian music so popular that we think worship is synonymous with music. But what you're going to find is in this chapter, there are nine things about worship that I'm going to identify to you, and none of them had to do with music. Oh, okay. Now, Abraham and Isaac may have sang a song on that mountain. I don't know. We don't know. But if they did, it was not important enough to be recorded in Scripture. So I'm going to show you nine things that are important to a worship experience that are in this chapter. Okay? Now, <clears throat> now, verse 1, verse 1. Uh, open this for me, will you? Verse 1, it says, after these things, God tested Abraham. Everybody say test. test. Okay. A test as part of our worship experience. If you have not been tested, you are going to be. Amen. If you have not been tested, you are going to be. And don't think every test comes from the devil. Okay, because God gives tests. Yeshua was tested in Matthew chapter 4. Just as soon as he got baptized... The Bible says he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. And he was, and he was tested. Why? What are tests for? Tests, first of all, 
they evaluate, they're an evaluation of our skill, our knowledge, our commitment, our, 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 our uh, uh, knowledge, love. What? Oh, you, did, okay, I'm not going to, I had them on the screen up there. Adam remembers. Okay, I had a long list of things. But the bottom line is this. Before anything is used, put in use, it is tested. Okay? Before you buy a car, you're going to road test it, won't you? Before, you, uh, you? before they commission an airplane to fly, it has a flight test. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Amen. Uh, in school, in order to go from, mil- from primary school to secondary school, you get tested, don't you? Uh, Do you <laughs> they still test in your school? Yeah, they do. To get out of school, you get tested. Amen. To get into university, you get tested. Right. To go on a job, you get tested. tested. They call it probationary period. And if you don't meet the employer's standards, then you're going to be looking for another job. You'll be trying to get another interview somewhere. See, So we will have tests. We will have challenges. We will have trials. But... It's important for us to be willing to go into these tests, to face these tests. James says in James chapter 1, count it all joy when you're faced with trials and tests. Why? Because it produces patience. And it helps you to have the confidence to function at the next level that the Father wants to place you. Okay? When David went before Goliath, he knew that he could kill Goliath. Why? Because he had already been tested by a bear and a lion. Amen. Amen. And when he saw that giant, the giant, the giant mocked him and, and made fun of him. And David said, you come to me with a sword and a spear. Oh, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Today, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to cut your head off and everybody will know that there is a God in Israel. See, he had already been tested, so he knew what he could do. Saul even tried to give him his his armor, his, his shield and his sword. David said, I don't want that stuff. I haven't tested it. I don't know if this will work. I know what does work. Hallelujah. Okay. So you're going to be tested. Number two. Watch this. After these things, God said, oh, you don't have, oh, okay. If you want to, you can, you follow me the best you can. All right. He said, after these things, God said to Abraham and He said, Abraham, Abraham, call his name twice. And Abraham said, here am I. Now, how do you think Abraham knew that was the voice of God? Abraham had relationship with him. So I want you to write down relationship. This is another element of worship. Okay? You got to be willing to be tested. And you have to have relationship with the Father. There is no substitute for a relationship with the Father. Because if you don't have a relationship with him, you will not know when he's talking to you. And he will talk to you. Why? Because he's your father. You're his child. So he's got to talk to you. He's got to train you. He's got to lead you. He's got to test you. He's got to build you up. He wants to use you. Okay, so you have to know his voice. All right. Uh, Let me ask you this question and you be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you because I've said this before. How many of you have ever said something told me? Don't you know something told me is not good enough? Because the devil is going to talk to you, too. If he talked to Jesus, he's going to talk to you. He's even going to quote scripture to you just like he quoted scripture to our Savior. See, but you have to know who that voice is. See, okay. And God will tell you to do some strange stuff. Pastor just talked just a minute ago about when we were there at Jubilee and Reba Rambo 
stuck, stood up there and tore a piece of page out of a Bible. Okay. And this is what? A, a, a house full of people, 18, I'm in 1800, 2000, uh, somewhere in there. And tell me to come, gives it to me, and said, Eat this. Now I'm standing there in front of all these people. And she's tearing up her Bible, balls it up, you know, and I don't know where her hands had been. But, And, and, and I, I mean, I, at first I'm embarrassed because nobody's, I never seen that before, never heard of anybody doing that before. And she balled it up and I'm thinking to myself, okay, what am I going to do? Is this really a woman of God? And so I was obedient. I took it and I put it in my mouth. I chewed it. She said, swallow it. I felt so silly, <laughs> but I swallowed it. And then she prophesied, and Pastor, you were, you were right on what you were saying. She said a, a lot more than what I'm going to, but this is the exact prophecy. She says what she said. Okay, now this is in 1986, 87, something like that. She said this, you are going to go out from this church as an ambassador from Jubilee Christian Center, you will go around the world teaching a balance, teaching and demonstrating a proper balance between worship and the word. That's what she, I, Dorothy, were you there that night? I felt so, I, I, I'm telling you, I felt so stupid. But, but I did it. I did it. And, and when I did it, there was a peace that came. I, I did not understand why, when, or how, or anything else. Okay? I just did it. Okay? Um, we have to know when the Father is speaking to us. Sometimes it's a word that comes out from the scriptures. Sometimes it's it's an inspiration that comes to you. Sometimes, only one time in my life that it was an audible voice, but I knew that voice. See, I knew it was his voice. See, Yeshua, Jesus, he said in John chapter 10, verse 27, he said, my sheep know my voice and they will follow me. See, you know, and it's an interesting thing because you don't argue with the voice. You, you know, when he speaks to us, we don't argue with him. We don't question him. We just do what he says do. Okay? Now, uh, in uh, verse 2, we're going to move on. Verse 2, this is what it says. He says, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Now, number three is journey. Everybody say journey. journey. Okay, say it loud. Say journey. Journey, journey means this. Uh, okay. Now, uh, Abraham is going to go on this journey. Why? Because God will take us on journeys. The Spirit will lead us on journey. We just saw in Matthew chapter 4 and also in Luke where, where, where the Spirit of the Lord led Yeshua, Jesus, out into the wilderness. Yeah. Oh, okay? Yeah. Okay. So he went on a journey. All right? And, and he was telling Abraham, take this son, Isaac, go on a journey to Mount Moriah. Okay? A journey, well, let me, t let me put it like this. There, there are three types of journeys. There's an intellectual journey. There's a spiritual journey. And there is a physical journey, okay? And we can go on any one individually, or sometimes we can go on all of them, yeah. okay? But the bottom line is he's going to separate us. He's going to send us somewhere where he can have a, an uninterrupted time with us so he can speak directly to us, yeah. okay? Yeah. All right. 
Give me a married couple. Who's, who's a married couple? Okay, I'm going to go right here. All right? Okay. Are they good parents? They pre- ah! <laughs> you guys. Okay, how long have you been married? 24 years. When you got married, did you have a good wedding? You did? A lot of people came, brought gifts, brought money, food. Okay, was it a Mexican wedding? Mariachi. <laughs> Mariachi. So it was long, wasn't it? It was long. Okay, okay. Now, after the wedding, you went, did you go on a honeymoon? Yes. Okay, tell me where you went. Jamaica. Jamaica, yaman. Yeah, uh-huh. You went to, went to Jamaica. Now, I got a question. This is a question. Okay. You went to Jamaica. How many of those relatives and friends did you take with you on your honeymoon? None. <laughs> but they brought you money. They brought you gifts. They, 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 they did all of these things, and you didn't take any of them, right? No, because they had to get away. They had to get away from every distraction because they had to spend some quality, intimate time together. They would talk about their future. They would talk about children. They would talk about careers. They would talk about education. They would talk about where they want to live. They would talk about all of these things that regarded their future. And that's the same thing that our Heavenly Father will do for us. For me, he brought me out of Los Angeles, out of the nightclubs, and sent me in a remote part of the ghetto of Oakland, California, so he could talk to me. See? And, And he will take us on these journeys, see, so that he can get our attention and he can speak to us. And if we are listening, we will get a commission, we'll get a mandate, we'll get a promise, we will get something that's going to help us achieve the goals or the the things that he wants us to do. All right. Number one is what? Talk to me now. Number two? Number three? Okay. Number four is offering. Everybody say offering. Offering. You didn't say anything. I'm, I'm looking at you. You didn't say anything. I blame English? No, I blame English. Yeah, see. Offering, offering. Yeah, thank you. All right. Okay. All right. Now, offerings, let me put it like this. Your worship experience is inappropriate and incomplete without an offering. It is inappropriate and incomplete without an offering because to those you love, you give. Amen? How many of you bought Christmas gifts for your enemies last Christmas? Okay, we had one in last service. She was a saint though. Okay. But how many bought something for, you, for the people that you love? That's everybody. Every one of us gave something to the people that we love. Because to, whom those, to those whom we love, we give. God loved the world so much that he what? Gave. gave. Love compels you to give. Okay, love compels you to give. You can give without loving, but it's very hard to love without giving. Amen. I got 14 grandchildren. I know. Oh, yeah. And some of my granddaughters have manipulated me from the cradle. I'm telling you. Oh, yeah. But I love it. I I love it. Oh, yeah. Okay. I I got a question for you. All right. If, now those of you in the first service, don't, don't let, don't, don't, don't. Okay. 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 Don't. Don't mess it up for me now, all right? All right, how many were not here in the first service? Okay, this question is for you. If our Savior, Yeshua, Jesus, if he came through this door, came into this sanctuary, where would he sit? Come on, where would he sit? He would sit next to you, Gary, huh? 
Because you love him the most, right? <laughs> no, he wouldn't do that. Maybe he would go by the door, huh, Brooke? Maybe he would go by the door and welcome people into his father's house. That sounds good, but that's not what he would do. Okay. Maybe he would take the microphone. You guys are going too fast with the slides up there. Maybe he would, maybe he would take the microphone and lead worship. Would you like to hear him lead worship? Yeah. Or, check this out. Pastor Dick, he is the living word. Wouldn't you love to hear him preach? Oh, man, that would be awesome, but that's not what he would do. That's what, okay. Go to Mark chapter 12, verse 41. Looks like you already have it. Who has it over here? You got it right here? Okay, read it out loud. Here we go. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money. This is you trying to sound like Barry White. Look at you. <laughs> oh, he did not sit with you, Gary. He did not sit at the door. He did not get up and lead worship. He did not preach. He sat by the offering. Why? Why would he sit by the offering? He tells us in chapter 9 of Matthew, he said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be. Amen? Amen? That's right. See, so your, your, your worship experience is incomplete and inappropriate without an offering. Okay. Now, it says over in um, verse 3, it says, Abraham rose early in the morning, he saddled his donkey, and he went to the place where the father told him to go. Okay, I'm paraphrasing. He went to the place where the father told him to go. All right? He was obedient. He was obedient. Obedient means more in your worship experience than anything else. Okay, you have to understand that. Because every other... Why don't you shut that down for me, will you? Don't, don't worry about it. Every other uh, thing that you do is meaningless if you're not obedient. Okay? Okay. Now, I told the story in the first service. I'm going to tell it to you also. Uh, as, as you know, I, I grew up in a small rural town, country town in the southeast corner of the state of Kansas. And we had 5,000 people in the city. That's when everybody came in from the farms. We had 5,000 people, okay? And uh, we were one of the poorer, of poorer, we were poor folks. <laughs> we were poor folks. And my mother, my mother worked uh, cleaning homes of some of the wealthy white people. Well, nobody was rich, but you know, more affluent white people in our city. And, and my mother, uh, to tell you the truth, my mother sacrificed a music career because she could really sing. She sacrificed a music career to raise six strong-willed, high-energy boys. Okay? And she pretty much raised us by herself because my father was in the military and he traveled all around. Okay? Now, now I am the third of six sons. Okay, and we all had chores to do. Okay, now my brother above me, num brother number two and me, number two and three, it was our job every week to clean the house because my younger brothers were, all they would do was get in the way. So... <laughs> It was our job to clean the house, make sure the house is clean, and wash all the clothes. Okay? Now, in a week's time, six high-energy, strong-willed boys can make some clothes mighty funky. A whole lot of them. Okay. And we had to go down to my Uncle Monroe's house because we didn't have a washing machine. But my Uncle Monroe had a brand-new Maytag washing machine with those rollers in it. You guys remember those? How many remember those? Yeah. Oh, okay. You guys are telling your age. I'm telling you. Boy. 
Okay. Anyway, and it would take us all morning long to do that. Now, the problem was, we lived right next door to the vacant lot. And every Saturday morning, all the boys in the neighborhood would come to the vacant lot and play ball, baseball, football, basketball, whatever season it was. They would come. And my brothers and myself, all of my brothers and myself, we were pretty decent. We were pretty good uh, 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 athletes, okay? And so one morning, on Saturday morning, my brother number two and me, we decided, hey, well, it was his idea. Hey, Ronnie, let's play a couple of... <laughs> Let's play a few games, and then we go do what Mama told us to do. Okay, we'll do, do what we're supposed to do. So I agreed. And so, now, let me tell you, time goes real fast when you're winning. It goes, it goes real slow when you're losing. It's agony when you're losing. But when you're winning, time goes real fast. So we are winning. We are having a good time. All of a sudden, we look down the a block away, and Mama is on her way home. And she's got a bag in both hands, and she's walking slow. That means she is tired and her feet are hurting. Okay? And you don't mess with my mama now. Oh, okay? She's a loving woman, but hey, you don't get on the wrong side of her. See, because that was back in the day when it was legal to beat your kids. <laughs> Some of y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah, it, it was legal back then. And, and we knew, we knew that we had a beating coming. We, we knew that she wasn't going to kill us because we were confident that she loved us. But we're going to be on the edge of death today. And anyway, she came home. And my brother disappeared, and he left me to face her, okay? And she came in the house, and I was shocked because she didn't do what I expected her to do. I expected her to grab something and just start beating, you know? But she didn't do that. She sat down, and she started crying. Now, when I was growing up, back in that era, it was two things that a young black boy didn't do. One was you didn't let anybody talk about your mama. And number two, you didn't make your mama cry. Okay. And my mother sat down and she started crying. And when she started crying, I knew she was hurt and disappointed because she spent all day cleaning up other people's houses. And then she'd come home to a nasty house. The clothes weren't washed or nothing, you know. And she cried. And then I'm feeling bad. I start crying. And then she said something that has helped to shape my life, my work ethic, and every, my character and everything else. I told her, I said, Mama, Mama, I'm sorry. Please don't cry. We intended to do everything that we were supposed to do. And she said, she said, she said, Ronnie, now she called me Ronnie, please don't call me Ronnie, all right. <laughs> she said, Ronnie, you're a good son, but I want you to know something, son. You, I know you intended to do the right thing, but you need to always remember there's going to be a whole lot of people in hell with good intentions. And that has helped to shape my life and my work ethic, do things when they're supposed to be done and do it right. Yeah. See, okay? And the message that I want to give you out of this is this. Delayed obedience is the same as disobedience. That's right. That's right. Delayed obedience is just the same as disobedience. Okay, number one is what? Come on, talk to me in the back. Now, number one is what? Yes. Number two. Relationship. Number three. Journey. Number four. Offering. Number five. Obedience. 
Number six. Oh, it's preparation. You ahead of me. Preparation. Everybody write preparation. How's my time? I'm good. Preparation. Okay, now look. It says that in the second part of verse three, it says, Abraham split the wood for the burnt offering. I had a problem with that when I, you know, in studying that, I always had a problem with that. See, because Abraham was well over 100 years old. See? And then he has his son, Isaac, and he has his servants with him. Okay? Three able-bodied people. He's well over 100 years old, and it says he cut the wood. See, I'd have a problem with that. See? I'm 75, and I am not going to cut wood. I'm going to go to Walmart. You know, uh, where, where, where do they sell wood? They sell wood over there, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, that's where I'm going. Abraham, this is an old man. He's well over 100 years old. Okay? And he has these two servants. He has his, 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 his uh, Isaac with him. So what does that say? It says, it says this to me. Okay? Nobody else can prepare you for experiencing the manifest presence of God. See, your girlfriend, you can call up on the phone and you guys can cry and talk and work your way through a problem, but she cannot worship you for you. She cannot worship for you. She cannot prepare herself to worship for you. She can pray for you. She can pray. Dorothy will pray for you. Amen, Dorothy? Dorothy will pray for her. But listen, she cannot worship for you. And you have to prepare your life. You have to prepare an altar yourself for yourself for you can worship and experience the manifest presence of our Heavenly Father. All right? Okay. Number seven. Number seven. Now, we're going to go to verse five. And verse 5 says this. Abraham says to his servants, and by the way, uh, I, as I shared just a little while ago, I studied from a Middle Eastern perspective, Middle Eastern, North African perspective. So when these servants, when we think about these servants, these are not just ordinary servants. One of them is his oldest son, Ishmael. Okay, you'll find this in the book of Yasha and the book of Jubilees. There was Yas uh, uh, Ishmael and his head servant, Eleazar. And they were the two that went with him, along with Isaac. Okay, now, he says, he says stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder, and we will worship you. Now, separation, and we talked about this a little while ago when we talked about you going on the honeymoon. Okay, you've got to separate yourself from everything or anybody that would prohibit you from doing what the Father has called you to do. For, okay, because see, Abraham knows. Abraham knows when he goes up on this mountain, okay, he knows that he is going to offer his son Isaac as a burnt offering on this. He's going to kill that boy. That's what God told him to do. He's going to, he's going to be obedient. He's going to kill that boy. If he would have taken Eliezer, who went, if he would have taken Eliezer and, 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 and Ishmael up there, and if he would have raised up the knife to kill that boy, they probably would have stopped him. They probably would have stopped him. Or they would have interfered with him in some kind of way. So Abraham has to separate himself. Sometimes we have to separate ourselves from all of the people, anybody who would interrupt the mandate that God has placed upon our lives. All right? I want you to take a, the Christmas story. Watch this. Okay? Uh, Mary's a young girl. Okay? Teenager. Okay? Well, what would you estimate her age? 16, 17, somewhere in there? Okay. And the angel comes to Mary. Mary, God has found favor in you. I'm paraphrasing. You are going to be the mother of the Christ child. Okay? What does Mary say? Be it unto me even as you have spoken. 
So Mary takes this by faith. Okay? Mary takes this and accepts this by faith. Okay? Now, the interesting thing is this. Mary did not go back to her mother and father and tell them that I'm going to be the mother of Jesus. She didn't go tell her best girlfriend. She didn't go tell her siblings. Okay? The Bible says, I believe it's in, go to um, Luke chapter 1, verse, 50, verse 51. 50, it's either 51 or 59. 51. What does it say? He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. No, that's not it. Luke 1? No, it, yeah. It, Mary, it says, where Mary went into the hill country with haste. Is that what it says? Somebody find it. 39, at the time. 39. Say it again. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered. Okay. Mary, Mary went into the hill country to her cousin Elizabeth. Why? Because the angel told Mary, hey, look, the same thing that's going to happen to you is already happening with your cousin Elizabeth. Okay. She went to some place. She went to a place where somebody would understand. See, if Mary would have told her mother and her father, see, the girl was already a spouse. She was already engaged to be married to Joseph. Okay. And if if she told them she was pregnant, they would have killed her. That would have brought shame to their family. In fact, the Bible says later on that even Joseph, when he found out, says he was, he was trying to figure out how to put her away privately. See, in other words, he's trying to be sneaky and get rid of her without anybody knowing. Okay? Until the angel stopped him and said, leave that girl alone. Uh, okay? Leave that girl alone. Okay. Now I got a question. I got a question. I want everybody with a teenage daughter to stand up. Everybody with a teenage daughter to stand up. Huh. Okay. All right. Now here's the question. Think about it. Wait a minute. Are you, a, you got a teenage daughter? She is the teenage daughter. You are the teenage daughter. Oh, okay. Y'all don't mess me up in here today. All right. Now, here's the question. What do you do when your teenage daughter comes to you and says, Mama, Daddy, I'm pregnant and God did it. <laughs> now, how do you deal with that? How, how do you... I know what you're going to say about Pastor. Oh, I want, what's God's address? I'm going to see God right now. You go, go ahead and sit down. Go ahead and sit down. But look at the dilemma that this child was in. Look at the dilemma she was in. And she, she was, could not afford to tell anybody else but the person that the angel had told her about. See? Sometimes you have to separate yourself because she knew her daddy would kill her. Okay? She knew that. She knew Joseph would kill her. Okay? But this is what God told her to do. All right? Number eight. Okay? Number eight is willingness to suffer. Nobody wants to suffer but are you willing to do it? Okay? Are you willing to suffer? See, when Jesus went into the garden to pray, John chapter 17, his father, I did what you wanted me to do. And now, the time has come for me to be the ultimate sacrifice, to make the ultimate sacrifice and what did he say? Not my will, but your will be done. 
There are three things in this passage of scripture. I don't, I don't exactly remember. You guys can tell me where it is. But in, uh, it says Abraham took fire, the wood, and the knife. Okay? And these three things would be elements of, of suffering that would cause suffering. First of all, the wood. The wood. Uh, Galatians 3.13 says a curse is the one who hangs up on a tree. Okay? And then there is the fire. Okay? The fire of the Holy Spirit does three things. It destroys, it changes, and it purifies. Okay? It destroys our old life, changes us in the image of Christ, purifies us so that we can be presented before a holy God. Okay? And then the knife. The knife would represent the shedding of blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Hebrews chapter 9. Okay? So these three things would represent elements of suffering. None of us want to suffer. None of us want to suffer. But are we willing to, if that's what God calls us to do? Amen? When Daniel stood there in front of the king, when he refused to stop praying, and the king said, you've got to be going to throw you into the, 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 the den of lions. Okay. Daniel had no idea that God was going to save him, but he was willing to go do, he was willing to continue to worship. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when the king told them, hey, if you don't bow down to this golden idol, we're going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And what did they say? They said, oh, king, we hope you live a long time. But we're not going to worship your idol. Okay, we are not going to bow down to your golden idol because we serve the God that made the gold. Okay. Are you willing to suffer? Sometimes the suffering is great. Sometimes it's not much at all. But are you willing to do what he Are you willing to do it? Okay. Number. Now I want to review one more time before I go to number nine. Number one is. Number four is what? Number two is what? Relationship. Okay, I'm just trying to find out if you're learning anything. Number five is what? Obedience. What's number seven? Separation. What's number eight? Willingness to suffer. All right. I'm not getting anything from back here. <laughs> you guys didn't go to sleep on me, did you? All right. Okay, number nine. And this is the last one. Number nine is absolute trust in God. Absolute trust in God. Now, Abraham and Isaac have not sang a song yet, but they're up there on this mountain. I cannot even imagine them, I cannot imagine them thinking about a song at all. But what I do imagine is this old man with a knife in his hand standing over his child about to, trembling and crying, about to put the knife into him and, and, and cut him and kill him, okay? Now, there's something interesting that you won't find in the Bible, but if you read some of the uh, books that the Bible mentioned, and I, I try to read all of them, okay? Uh, in the book of Jubilees, uh, what the, the, the way the writer of Jubilees describes this, he says, Isaac... Now, keep in mind, Isaac is a type of Christ, okay? And there's a certain way that you have to, to uh, uh, slaughter a sacrifice, okay? If you go to the Middle East now, there's a word called halal. All the, you know, the meat that you, even here, the meat that you buy, they call it halal meat. In other words, it's been cut in a certain way. And so Isaac realizes that, that, that he is on this altar, he's tied up, 
And in the book of Jubilees, it says, Isaac says, Father, bind me good. When he realizes he's a sacrifice, he says, bind me good so that when you cut me, I will not flinch. And why is that? Because if there's any blemish, there can be no scars, no blemish except that, that halal cut. Oh, okay? And he would said, all of this would be meaningless if you cut me the wrong way. Okay. Here's the old man standing there trembling. He's standing there trembling. And he's about to sacrifice his son. Okay. Get a picture of that in your mind. He's about to sacrifice his son. And he's going to do what his father told him to do. He has absolute trust in God. See, because he's already told the, 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 his servants. He said, we're going up there to this mountain and we're going to worship and we're going to come back to you. See, so he's already made it up his mind. He's going to kill his son and he's going to stay there until God raises him up again. He's already made up his mind. See, he has absolute trust. How does he have absolute trust? Because over in chapter 17 and in chapter 21, God has already told him, through this child, your inheritance shall be. This is the one. This is the one. Your inheritance shall be. He holds God to his promise. God said it. It has to be him. He raised a knife. And you all know the story. He raised a knife. And he gets ready to plunge the knife into the child. And then he hears a voice again. He knows this voice. Stop, Abraham. He knows that voice. Okay? That relationship. from He knows that voice. He says, stop, Abraham. Don't hurt the child. I see that you love me more than you, wait, than you love this child that you waited a hundred years for. Okay? Now, I'm going to say something that's not in the scriptures, but it is in my imagination. Okay? Because I can hear God saying, Abraham, don't kill your child. Don't let your child die for me. I'm God. I am love. I cannot allow you to love me more than I love you. So, Abraham, don't let your child die for me. I have to let my child die for you. We see in Revelations where it says, Behold the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Behold the Lamb. This is what our worship experience is about. Music is like icing on the cake. Okay? The real worship is how we live and how we serve our Heavenly Father. It's about being obedient. More than anything else, it's about being obedient. See, if Abraham would have taken his son to another mountain, keep this in mind. Now, this mountain was three days from Beersheba to Mount Moriah was a three-day journey. If Abraham would have said, well, I'll just go with this other mountain that's a half a day away. If he would have went to any other mountain, he would have killed his child and God would have let him. Obedience. God told him where to go. He went where he was supposed to go. And as a result, he received a blessing. He received the blessing of promise. Okay. Jesus said, Yeshua said in John chapter 4, verse 23, says the Father is looking for worshipers. He said, he says the hour is come and now and is now when true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Are you the worshiper that God is looking for? Take the hand of somebody. Bow your heads. Are you the worshiper? 
that God is looking for? If you're the worshiper that he's seeking, are you the worshiper that he is requiring? See, someone who's willing to face the test, someone who's willing to have the kind of relationship with him that he desires. Are you willing to take the journey and go where he sends you? Are you willing to give of what you have been blessed with so that his causes and his purposes can be fulfilled? Will you be obedient? Will you prepare yourself, prepare your life so that you can stand before God without any shame, without any guilt or shame? Will you separate yourself from anything, from anything that would interrupt what God wants to do in your life? Will you be willing to suffer if necessary? And will you have absolute trust in God? Close your eyes, don't look at me, bow your heads. Father, we thank you for the word today. We hope and pray. We believe that, that your word has touched people's heart today. Now with every eye closed and with every head bowed, you're holding somebody's hand. If you're here this morning, if you're not saved, if you're backslidden, if you're out of right relationship with the Father, and you know that you are, don't nobody have to tell you, you know that you are. If you're out of right relationship with the Father and today the word of God, the Father has spoken to you by his spirit. He said something to you today. Maybe he's saying you need to get right with me today and you know that voice. Maybe you backslidden, you know that voice. Today is the day. If you're not born again, the Bible says, that you can have a new life in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he becomes a new creation. All the old things pass away and everything becomes new. New, did you get that new? Not recycled, not repaired, new. You can have a brand new life. Okay, you're holding somebody's hand. If you're that person, you wanna rededicate your life to the Lord tonight or today, or you want, to, you want to get saved today. You want to come into right relationship with the Father. I want you to squeeze the hand of that person you're holding. Go ahead. Don't look at me now. Don't look at me. This is between you and God. Squeeze the hand of the person that you're holding right now. Okay? Now, listen carefully. Don't look up. Don't look around. But if someone squeezes your hand as an indication that they want to get right with the Father today, they want to rededicate their lives, they want to get saved, if they squeeze your hand, I want you to lift that person's hand gently but boldly. Lift that hand so I can see it. Go ahead, do it. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. This is between you and God. Okay? This is between you and God. All right. Put your hands down and look this way now. <coughs> look this way. Okay. Uh, I was sharing with Adam this morning. I was on a television show with, you know, you know, John Paul Jackson. He's a statistician, a scientist. He's a statistician. And this is what I heard him say. We were on TBN and he said this. He said, that there's only about 6% of born-again Christians that ever lead anybody to Christ. 6% of born-again Christians lead people to Christ. Okay? Now, what we, we, we have a lot of excuses. You might say, well, Ron Canole, I don't, I don't sing like you do. Or Pastor Dick, Pastor Adam, I don't preach like you do. Or I don't pray like Pastor Carla or whatever. You might have excuses. No, the excuses are no good today. Because somebody just squeezed your hand as an indication that they want to get right with God. Here's what I want you to do. Okay? If someone squeezed your hand, I want you to take that person by the hand 
and I want you to gently but firmly bring them to the altar and let me pray for them. And Ron, put me in the key of F. Bring them to the altar, altar right now. All right? Hallelujah. Amen. Put me in the key of E flat. I'm sorry. E flat. E flat. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and as thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb, of God I come, I come. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, church. Come on, Jubilee Bridge. Come on, let's give God some praise today. Look what God is doing. Stand up. Stand up and praise him. Look what God is doing today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Adam, come and stand with me. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, I'm going to ask you to join hands. All right? Join hands. I like this part of the service the most. Amen. 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 Because, okay, join hands, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I want you to repeat after me. Okay, look at me. Look at me now. And I want everybody to pray this, even you folks in the seated area. They need your support up here. Uh, okay? Because they're letting everybody in the place know that their lives are not together the way they want them to be. You know because you were up here the same way. And you needed support. Now it's time for you to support them. All right? Now look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Okay. This is not whisper a prayer time. Uh, okay? I want you to pray, repeat after me. And pray this prayer and pray it out loud. Speak it out loud, okay? And let the devil know that he does not have a place in your life anymore. All right? Okay. And you folks, repeat it with him. All right? Here we go. Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to give my heart to you and rededicate my life to you. I'm sorry for my sins. I believe Yeshua, Jesus, sacrificed his life for me. He was buried in a grave and he arose on the third day so that I might have a right relationship with you. With the confession of my mouth, and the belief in my heart that Jesus is Lord. I declare right now, I'm saved. I'm renewed. I'm born again. Devil, hear me good. Hear me good. I don't belong to you anymore. I belong to Jesus. I belong to Yeshua. He's my king. He's my savior. He's my redeemer. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Now you can play that thing, Ron. Go ahead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, you folks out there, you can be seated, but you got to stay here. No, stay here. Stay here. Stay here. Okay. I, I, I want you to look, look at this good-looking man here. Where's Michelle? Come on. Come on, Michelle. Okay. Okay. Now, these, this, this handsome man and this beautiful lady, they are the pastors of this church. Okay? I don't know if you are first time here or what. I do not know that. But listen, God has anointed them strategically, placed them here, trained them and strategically placed them here just for you. Amen. Just for you. There might be questions that you might have about salvation or being a Christian or a spiritual life or whatever. They are prepared to help you. Okay? They are, and they're willing to do that. They've both given up a lot to... to to fulfill this calling that's on their lives. And it's just for you. Okay? So, uh, 
I'm going to give the microphone to Adam and listen if they will have some instructions for them. Is that correct? Yes. Oh, okay. And if you don't have a Bible, they'll make sure you get one. That's right. If you don't have something, if you need prayer for something, they'll make sure you get prayer. Oh, okay. Something specific. Oh, okay. But we're not going to just bring you up here and leave you alone. They want to get in touch with you and follow up on you and make sure that you can have a victorious and a productive life. That's what you want. Amen. 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 All right. I love you guys. Do you give hugs? Can I get a hug? Ah. Come on, mama. Amen. Let's give Ron a big hand, everybody.